We're just really excited to have Vajahat here at Google and um, I'm going to let him kind of speak a little bit about himself and his journey as a writer and um, at the end we'll open it up to a discussion so if anybody has questions for him, um, you know, definitely stick around uh, to, to speak with him. And we also have lunch with him after if anybody hasn't eaten yet, uh, feel free to join us. So Vajahat. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Sohair, for inviting me. Thank you, Google, for filling up this vast auditorium with my admiring fans. Uh, being at Google marks the apex of my professional career. Uh, I've traveled far and wide to finally be here, across the great Y237, from a mysterious land known as Fremont, uh, known as Fremontistan to all the Muslims, Pakistanis, and Afghans who live there, home of the best chapli kebab outside of Kabul. Uh, thank you for inviting me to your home, Google, uh, known to the world as the premier search engine, known to your enemies as the Death Star, and known to all South Asian parents as a fertile factory for future spouses of their unmarried children. Uh, in fact, today's Google speech, and I'm being totally serious, has solidified my worth as a human being uh, for my family members, uh, who in their typical South Asian bluntness uh, see my professional career as a writer as, I quote them, useless. Uh, today they said, uh, try to get a job at Google. <laughs> and I told them that, I'm not making this up, I said Google invited me to speak for them. And they're like, ha ha, but after the speech, get a job, <laughs> stop being useless. True story. Uh, honored to be speaking here today, but mostly, and I won't lie, this whole speech will be very honest. I'm mainly excited to be eating at the famed Google cafeteria, which I, thank you, people are nodding their head. They're like, that, that is why I work here. <laughs> I, I came from Pakistan just for the cafeteria. Uh, I hear it's a modern Shangri-La of gluttonous excess and unbridled awesomeness. And also, I won't lie, just bear with me, I have been told by every single Pakistani working at Google that I have to try the infamous Google bathroom where like a robot cleans your butt, right, or something? Yeah, I heard it is a religious experience, life-changing experience, and as such, I have loaded up on fiber and water. But <laughs> continuing, I'm now going to begin my speech with a pathetic attempt to kiss up to Google, shamelessly, by celebrating the recent remarkable failures of your competition. First, congratulations, Googlers, on the recent Apple iPhone 5's dismal map application. Congratulations. Uh, I used their map app to get to Google today and I ended up at Yahoo instead. Uh, let's take a moment to simultaneously mock and pity uh, the people who bought Facebook at $32 a share. I have just made that my Facebook status, so Googlers like it. The irony will be priceless. Uh, let it be known when and if I'm ever invited to speak at Facebook or Apple, I shall mock Google+. Sorry, no offense to anyone. I'm equal opportunity. Uh, I also like to thank security, who for some reason kept calling me Rajiv. Uh, I didn't correct them. Thank you, Rajiv, whoever you are, for your parking spot. Uh, once I entered Google, I saw so many South Asians, I thought it was at Cisco. And a part of my heart swelled with pride, and I looked at these random South Asians. I did the Miyagi look. For those of you who have seen Miyagi, I'm talking about Pat Morita from the original Karate Kid, not Will Smith's son. At the end of Karate Kid, Pat Morita, Miyagi, looks at Daniel's son with a sense of pride. He looks at him like this. And I looked at these random South Asians with pride in my face, and they just kept staring back at me, not eliciting the response I wanted. And I think a few of them were like, who's this weird tech support from India? I do not hail from India. The family hails from the motherland known as Pakistan, which is the most popular country on earth right now. <laughs> When people think of Pakistan, they think of rainbows and cupcakes and ponies and babies. Pakistan is the most toxic brand name in the universe. This is a true story. A few of my friends have heard this. A Palestinian man came up to me last year and said the following, bro, bro, things are really bad in Pakistan right now, bro. When a Palestinian takes pity on you, you're effed. All right, you're effed. And to make matters worse, I have the hat trick of kryptonite toxic brand names. I'm an American Muslim 
of Pakistani descent or a Muslim American Pakistani. Awesome. Uh, being Pakistani American is so bad right now that I am forced to tell people I'm pre-partition Indian. <laughs> Which, yeah, this, is, this is a good crowd. This is a good crowd. Yeah, Muslim Pakistani American as a brand name is about as popular as death, taxes, and herpes. No offense to herpes. Um, but speaking about stories, I actually, in all honesty, I, the title of today's story is, I think, from Chaiwala to to playwright, The Rise of a Pakistani American Writer. True story, I was in Nepal, so hair was after me for a title, I was exhausted. I wrote the title thinking it was a joke that no one would ever seriously consider that as a title. So hair two days later sends me the official Google letterhead that says from Chaiwala to playwright. <laughs> the rise of, I was hoping, a pre-partition Indian writer. But no, I am indeed a Pakistani American writer. And speaking about stories, I'll tell you a quick story about how I got to Google today. But before I talk about stories, there's this great quotation by a poet, uh, Muriel Rukeyser, which says the following, the universe is made up of stories, not atoms. The universe is made of stories, not atoms. Here's another great quote. Human beings are natural storytellers. They can't help telling stories. They turn things that aren't really into stories into stories because they like narratives so much. Everything, faith, science, love, needs a story for people to find it plausible. No story, no sale. That's writer Adam Gopnik in The New Yorker talking about Jonathan Gottschall's book, The Storytelling Animal, which posits that the human being is the unique storytelling animal in all of existence. That's how we operate, that's how we communicate, that's how we learn. Even in ancient 7th century Arabia, the storyteller was valued more than the swordsman. I know you guys won't believe me, it's a true story. Now this was a culture where tribes needed the most skilled swordsmen because raids were part of daily activity. And they needed protection. Yet in those days, when a famed, talented poet came to their land, they insisted he would stay and perform for the community. And again, this makes sense considering that the human being is a unique storytelling animal. Stories give humans identity and purpose. Think about religion. Regardless if you like religion or not, it's a powerful force. Christians, how do they learn about how to behave? their morals, their etiquette, the stories of Jesus. In, in fact, Jesus taught through parables, which are stories. For Muslims, very popular right now, for those of you who don't know, they follow the Hadith, which is a collection of stories that talk about the etiquette of the Prophet Muhammad. Stories give humans identity and purpose. They also help us pass down our values, ideals, beliefs, and cultures. For example, wherever I've gone in the world, Every single culture knows the story of the boy who cried wolf. Every culture, every language. Every culture knows that that's a story you tell your children to teach them not to lie. Now we can sit there and be didactic and say, hey, don't lie or I'll hurt you. But instead we couch that moral in a narrative, in a story. In a story featuring a whining, annoying boy and a hungry, murderous wolf. Which is slightly disturbing, but it works. Stories are also how we brand and present ourselves to the world. Every major company has an About Us section which talks about their origin. Stories are how we meet people. Stories help us communicate. Stories are how we learn about one another. In America, in fact, when you meet someone for the first time, you often ask them, hey man, what's your story? Followed by, you're paying for the bill. Successful stories, the ones that stick and resonate, need people's emotional investment. So, let me tell you of a quick story today, in half hour, about a dude named Wajahat Ali, that's me, born in El Camino Hospital, raised in Fremontistan, California, graduate of Bellarmine and All Boys Jesuit Catholic High School, who got an English degree from UC Berkeley, despite not, despite not knowing any English when he was born, for the first four years of his life, ended up writing a play in college uh, for an English, uh, English class assignment, who then went to law school at UC Davis, got licensed as an attorney, couldn't find work, applied to Google, didn't get the job, somehow ended up with an unlikely, unlikely irreverent, odd career, or hobby, according to my South Asian family, uh, as a professional paid writer, or professional lafunga, according to my family. Lafunga, for those of you who speak Urdu, means loafer. Uh, and now he is at Google speaking. So are you guys still with me? 
That was awesome, enthusiastic, wonderful. <laughs> just really just inspired me to continue. All right, here we go. Once upon a time, there was a shy, awkward, constantly sick, only child of Pakistani immigrant parents born in Bay Area, California, who was the only left-handed member of his entire family, which made every single family member in Karachi, Pakistan think he was a jinn, true story, who walked around in a white, sh on a white shirt smeared with lentil stains and sweat patches, who was addicted to chai because his grandfather used to feed him his chai with teaspoons when he was a kid, and when the kid who grew up, he had his own little small chai cup with his own chai. And every day, this kid was healthy. And healthy is a Pakistani term for big boned. And healthy and big boned are always accompanied by this motion, which is very, very subtle. He was so healthy that his grandmother and mother used to be able to find pants for him only in the young adult section of Mervyn's when the kid was six years old. And true story, they bought these pants, and because the kid was so healthy, they had to roll up the pant sleeves. And when the kid asked, how come his pants were different from everyone else, the mom said, it's fashion sense. It's a good fashion sense. Uh, he was so healthy that he went to Harker School in Saratoga, where there were uniforms, humiliating. He was forced to wear husky pants. And these husky pants, true story, have a big patch on the right side of your butt with big bold letters saying, husky. Very subtle. When entering preschool, the appropriately titled Child's Hideaway, the kid only spoke three words of English. The three words were the following. Shut up, because his mother used to tell him shut up. Idiot, because his mother used to say often shut up, idiot. And for those of you who are child of the 80s, you guys remember that commercial, O oh, SpaghettiO? Anyone? One, two people, three people. I'm old and decrepit, awesome. O oh, O oh, SpaghettiO, and the kid couldn't speak English, so he said O oh, O oh, PasGettiO. Three words of English. A year later, while attending James Leach Elementary School, the teachers didn't know what to do with this kid or any other minority, as a matter of fact, so they put him and the four other minorities in ESL, which is English as second language. It was him, two Asian American girls, the black kid who was there because he was the only black kid in school, <laughs> spoke perfect English, and this kid. True story. And for several months, a teacher used to stand in front of this kid and used to say, whatever. And the Pakistani kid looked back and said, whatever. And the teacher said, no, no, whatever. And the kid looked back and said, whatever. This happened for months. And until, until finally the kid figured out the V's and W's are not the same. The kid also made many fateful trips to the motherland, Karachi, Pakistan, uh, which left many deep impressions, literally. For example, the first time he went, he got hit by a motorcycle. Awesome. Four years old. Kid goes straight up in the air, lands flat on his forehead, forehead explodes. Doctors say if he would have landed one inch to the left or one inch to the right, he would have been flatlined. Uh, the local doctors apparently didn't have sophisticated equipment and they operated on him with dull, like a dull knife and spoon, which gave him a scar to this day that makes him look like a Klingon baby. Uh, in the 90s, he proudly showed off what he called a Klingon scar to women thinking it would work in getting dates. It didn't. In the 21st century, he evolved his pop culture nuance and said this is the Harry Potter scar, thinking it would get him women. It didn't. Apparently, at age nine, because he didn't have enough of Pakistan, he went back where he got pneumonia. Awesome. Which went undiagnosed for two and a half weeks. And so he lost 40 pounds and lay dying, essentially, on the straw mat on the second floor of his grandmother's building. True story. And the grandmother's tenant, a Pakistani whiskey drinking American educated doctor who talked like this in an interesting accent, that's how he talked, came upstairs to do a routine checkup and said, oh my God, this boy has pneumonia, take him to the hospital. Which they did, and they said, oh, he has pneumonia. Oh, good, you barred him, that's good. And uh, true story, <laughs> it was very casual. And they're like, yeah, if it wasn't one more week, he would have not, you know, Bichara would have not made it. Uh, and so I survived. And again, in high school, the kid said, you know what, let's go back to the motherland, where in high school he went back and contracted malaria and 104 degree high temperature for three days. Whatever doesn't kill you gives you mosquito larvae in your bloodstream. <laughs> Rewind, fifth grade, 
Again, at Harker School in Saratoga, the overweight, sweaty, socially awkward, Pakistani, left-handed, healthy boy with lentil stains on his shirt had also suffered from severe allergies. He was so sick that he had missed 37 days of school. They were about to kick him out. He had to make a plea to the principal to let him stay. Okay, the school was just about to kick him out, and finally, a competent doctor named Dr. Biederman, who did not work at Kaiser, no offense to Kaiser, gave him medication that actually worked. And so this kid recovered, but had to work harder in fifth grade than he did it all in high school to make an epic comeback. Tutors, after school, after school uh, learning, catching up a month's worth of work. Things were looking bleak until one day, his fifth grade teacher, Miss Peterson, hailing from Kentucky, asked the class to write a one-page fictional short story. Now this was 1991, a strange time in America, where Madonna had conical breasts, Z Cavaricis were all the rage. Anyone know Z Cavaricis? You had them, thank you for being bold enough to admit it. We all owned a pair. Will Smith was known as the Fresh Prince, and uh, Kevin Costner was chosen to play Robin Hood. You guys remember this? So, because of this, the kid decided to write a pa parody and satire of Robin Hood, and the kid's story went from one page to five pages to 10 pages. The teacher loved the kid's story and made him perform it in front of the fifth grade for the first time ever this sweaty, healthy, mashallah, healthy kid, awkward, shy, performed the story. The classroom loved it. Then they said perform it in front of the fifth and sixth grade. They loved it. The kid brought home the story to his father. The father reads the story and says, beta, which means son, you might have a talent. You should consider becoming a writer. The mother who was in the kitchen overheard this with fear in her eyes, ran out and said, yes, but first become a doctor. <laughs> this was 1991, the age was 10. Let's do a group exercise. In South Asian families, there is a holy trinity of professions. Let's go with number one. What's number one? Doctor. doctor. Number two? Engineer. Engineer. Number three? Lawyer. Not lawyer, no one cares about lawyers yet. Number three is dubious businessman who somehow makes a lot of money and buys a suburban home, marries a wife who's around seven on the hotness scale, and has a Lexus. Number four, failure. All right, those are your four options as occupations. But because of this momentous occasion where this kid told this story, for the first time in his life, this overweight, shy, awkward, healthy, lentil stained boy who was healthy gained confidence and a sense of empowerment. And for the briefest of moments, for about two hours after the story, even some popularity. And ever since that day, the awkward boy ended up spending all of his free time investing in the passion of storytelling, performance, movies, and reading. During the summers, him and his best friend Kashif made their own home movies because no one invited them to parties because they were dorks. And they wrote, directed, acted, and edited in their own homemade movies, such as the ambitious and epic Formula Trilogy, featuring a diabolical scientist who creates a formula that could destroy Earth, but each time his nefarious plot is sorted by the gruff, surly detective, played by me, who breaks protocol and a few necks, but saves the day. They also did their own takes on popular movies. If you guys remember, uh, in the 1991, there was a celluloid classic by the name of Tango and Cash, starring Kurt Russell and Sly Stallone. We did our own, called Lambada and Doe. Think about it. The boy grew up, stayed healthy, and ended up going to an all-boys Jesuit taught high school, Bellarmine, where he emerged as the token representative of all things Pakistan, South Asia, Muslim, and Islam. He must have given eight talks in Islam throughout his entire career. He had a choice to stay isolated in the corner as the token, not sharing his religious or cultural identity, or be authentic, be himself, be open, and communicate his multi-hyphenate identity to his Catholic diverse peers. So he, embra he embraced his role as the cultural ambassador of his peoples and enjoyed relating tales and communicating stories. In his senior year, he decided he's gonna try his hand at improv comedy. And he successfully joined the school comedy troupe entitled The Sanguine Humors, where he created the endearing popular comedy icon known as Captain Brown Man. An ornery, one-eyed pirate captain with a hook for a hand who always entered the stage saying, dar. The name is Captain Brown Man. It worked. At that time, it was a huge hit. We weren't that politically correct in those days. Once upon a time, continuing, there was a young, healthy, overweight boy who grew up 
entered UC Berkeley and decided to go to the gym for the first time in his life. And he slimmed down. And he decided the lentil stains would always be on his white shirt, so he started wearing black and gray. And then he dressed a bit better, was socially active, joined a lot of student groups, such as the Muslim Student Association, which apparently makes him a member of Ikhwan and Hamas and Hezbollah for the rest of his life. Uh, I am just kidding. This is taped, right? I am just kidding. <laughs> Barack Obama is not a Muslim president. If he is Muslim, he's the worst Muslim of all time. The dude eats pork openly. All right? I love America. All right. So I was a member of the Muslim Student Association, joined the Student Advocate Office, and ended up taking way too many academic units because I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. And every day, this kid, me, ended up running around like a crazy headless chicken, not sleeping too much and having crazy fun times. Along with a few friends at UC Berkeley, we created the first sketch comedy troupe entitled The Guad Squad, where they wrote, directed, and edited their own sketches. Over the next three years, I ended up playing a gay vampire, a Scottish immigrant owner of an olive garden, a Pakistani student living with belligerent Italian immigrants, a well-endowed Italian, immer <laughs> well Italian American liquor store owner, don't ask, and a Ukrainian weightlifter, among many other endearing titles. This boy spent his nights teetotaling, a Muslim dork who didn't drink, who never partied, spending an inordinate amount of time in his awesome apartment playing host and playing video games such as NBA 2K and NFL 2K, entertaining similarly dorky, horny, virginal Muslim American bachelors, engaging in practical jokes, sophomoric humor, and pretty much being dorks 24-7. And as the perpetual ho hosts of these dorks, he ended up making vats of chai every day for four years. By the end of his junior year, his chai had become infamous across the nation, legendary because it nourished the bellies of horny single dorky Muslim men. And even when I was lucky, a few women came into the apartment, only for five minutes. His senior year of college, he was chosen to be a board member of the student group Muslim Student Association, which of course brands him a lifetime member of Hezbollah, Hamas, Ikhwan, and everything else. I'm just kidding, because this is on YouTube. He reluctantly accepted. The year was 2001. Also on a whim, that same year, he decided to apply to a short story writing class. He had three choices. Each class was taught by a different professor. One class was taught by this guy named Ishmael Reed. The guy, the guy this is me now, I had no idea who Ishmael Reed was. I simply liked the name Ishmael. It was very biblical. And I'm like, you know what? I'm leaning towards applying to Ishmael's class. I asked a faculty advisor, out of all these three, who should I apply to, because I can only apply to one. He said, well, this guy Ishmael, he kind of lets you do your own thing. He gives you freedom. Done, soul, the dude's name was Ishmael, he gives you freedom. I applied to Ishmael Reed's class on a whim. 3.58 p.m., Wheeler Hall, third floor, deadline was 4 p.m. I wrote it in pen. I didn't have lines, so the, the, the paper went like this. It was like curving this way with my, my ink. It looked like a Lahori publication of a book. For those of you who know about Lahori publication, you know they don't print their stuff in a straight line. And all I had was a 12-page play script, because you had to submit a 15-page short story. Didn't have a short story. So I submitted one of my Guad Squad scripts about two horny, thieving English noblemen and a magical donkey that wore a monocle. The, yeah, I know, it was genius. <laughs> the, the play was entitled, All This for an Ass. It's all I had, I submitted it. All was well, because I got into the class. It was 2001, senior year, I was 20, about to turn 21. Until one day, the two towers fell. And there was madness. And all of us 20-year-olds, who were just kids, just students, part of the Muslim Student Association, all of a sudden became the accidental activists, the cultural ambassadors of 1,400 years of Islamic civilization, where we were forced to know everything about Iraq, and Afghanistan, and the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad, and Muslims, and South Asians, and hell, even Sikhs, and everything. And we were just students, but we, get, we got hate mail coming from people. We had to represent a community that was terrified and afraid. Muslim women who wore the hijab, which is a head covering, at UC Berkeley were afraid of going out to school. It was a crazy time, crazy climate, for those of you who remember. And for whatever reason, someone, my roommate, who made the website, 
for the MSA decided it'd be fun to name me the social coordinator and public relations liaison. So guess who was getting all the press contacts and all the interviews? Me. I ended up becoming what I call the accidental activist for about 75% of my senior year. For three weeks after 9-11, I couldn't even go to school. Now, fast forward three weeks, I'm in Ishmael Reed's class. I'm up to perform a short story. Crap, I gotta write a short story, take it to class and perform it. At 4 a.m., I came up with a story about two ogres who were married for 50 years celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary who secretly hated one another, poisoned each other's goblets, and are waiting the entire time to kill one another. I know, genius. Uh, this was before Shrek, so I was a genius. I was just late on that, that ogre kick. Six hours later, 10 a.m., go to class, read the story, which was entitled Bulbous and Rotunda's 50th Wedding Anniversary. Class loves it. I'm terrified because I think Ishmael Reed's gonna chew me out for missing class for three weeks. Ishmael says, see me after class. I'm scared out of my mind. Ishmael says, you're a natural playwright. You don't know it. Don't waste your time in my short story writing class. I'm going to take you outside of my short story writing class, and you're going to have to write me a play. Write me a play. Write me 20 pages. You pass the class. I'm like, dude, you're crazy. Like, I don't know how to write a play. Just let me write short stories. He goes, nope. Write me a play. You know what? As an African American, we have been through this before. I can see 10 years down the line. It's going to be a tough time for Muslims and Pakistanis. Your stories aren't being told. What people do see is an extremist narrative. Sometimes, not only the way to fight back, but the way to push forward is through arts and culture. You should write me a story about a family. You know what? Make it a Pakistani family. You know what? Aren't you a Muslim? Make it a Muslim American Pakistani family. You ever read Death of a Salesman? I'm like, yes. You ever read Long Day's Journey in the, uh, in the Night? I said, yes. Something like that. All right, bye. So I'm like, crap. I got to write 20 pages of a play. I've never written a play in my life. What am I going to do? Now, for those of you who don't know, Muslims celebrate something called Ramadan. And up to a certain age, when you're young, at the end of Ramadan, you get something called Eidi, which is like money. So I was like 20, and that was the last year I got Eidi. I got like 20 bucks. I was broke and I was poor. I took the $20 to this cultural relic of the 20th century known as Borders. You guys might remember it. I went to the drama section, I said plays, picked up two plays, they came within 20 bucks. So being the son of Pakistani immigrants, thank you, I looked at the refund policy, <laughs> and they said, within 15 days, if you return the plays in good condition, you get your money back. I'm like, done. Read the plays within 15 days, went back every 15 days, got two more plays. Did this for two months, tried to figure out how, true story. <laughs> Hey, it was their policy. I just exploited it. Uh, son of Pakistani immigrants. We stretch a dollar to make it 20. Uh, I'm proud. I don't care. Uh, figured out how to write a play. Started the play for my 21st birthday in November 2001. And finished it for my 23rd birthday, 2003. The way that happened is submitted 20 pages. And Ishmael liked it so much, every couple of months he said, give me five more pages, give me five more pages. Finished it as a birthday present to myself at the age of 23. And because of that, Ishmael Reed in 2003 invited me to Spencer's Grotto in Berkeley and said, the script is great and now we need to do a staged reading. I, of course, asked, what's a staged reading? He said, my wife here, Carla Blank, she's a theater scholar and dramaturge. She'll direct the staged reading. Carla looked over at him and said, really? I will? She goes, yeah, yeah, you'll do it. True story. So I went to Sheikh Google true story, and typed in stage reading to figure out what it was. Stage reading is essentially when you get a couple of actors, you put them on a couple of chairs, and they act out the play while reading the script. That's a stage reading. If you're successful, you get 50 people. Now, mind you, at this time, I was 23 years old, jobless, had to move back home where I was in my high school bedroom, and I woke up every day to find $5 in my wallet. And when I asked who put the $5 in my wallet, my father said to me, he used to sneak the five dollars in my wallet every night because he said, no man should be without five dollars. <laughs> and so out of both pity and kindness, I moved back to my family home with nothing much going on for me except this play. Now, what happened was I believed in the power of storytelling. This is now 2003. Interesting time. And I wanted to inspire my, and empower my South Asian and Muslim communities and make them believe that there's power in their stories. 
and I wanted to make them realize that their stories had value. So what we did is, I said, I'm going to reach out to my community first and foremost. So what we did was we used the internets to make a call to anyone who was remotely brown with a pulse who wanted to audition for this play that I had wrote, written called The Domestic Crusaders about a family of Muslim Pakistani Americans, six characters, a grandfather, the Pakistani immigrants, and their three American-born children who all convene in the family house for one day. Six, six roles. I said, anyone remotely with a tan, with a pulse, interested in performing, that's the only prerequisite, come try out for this play. Now, we did auditions at Chandni. Every community has a Chandni. Chandni restaurant slash community hall is where people go to get married, get divorced, have buffets, have religious experiences, convert to Islam, convert out of Islam, do amins, do bismillahs, do Hanukkahs, do Sikh weddings. Every community has a Chandni. I told the Chandni owner, I'm going to do auditions at your place. It's a local place. Can you, make, can you just give me a space? He says, I'll let you come on the weekends. You have to buy at least seven buffets. I'm like, done. I'll make you buy. I'll promise that the people who come audition, I'll convince them to buy buffets, which happened. The first week, first time we did it, eight people, eight to 13 people did it. They came and uh, did the stage reading. They were very hesitant, skeptical. But they read the script. And within an hour, I could tell they were jazzed. The second week, word of mouth spread. 20 people did the audition. At the end of a month and a half, 135 people auditioned for the play. Now, we need a place to stage the play. So we went to Chandni's competition, Mehran Restaurant, which is right next door to Chandni. I'm not making this up, in New York, California. And I, I said to uh, Fayaz, the, the owner, I said, what will it cost for me to use your hall, transform it into a dinner theater experience, and you could give me a South Asian buffet. He said, $15 cost. I realized I couldn't handle it. So I brought in a heavy hitter, my father, as my messenger, who came in, rolled up his sleeves, had a sit down with Fayaz, and said the following, Fayaz, why do you disrespect me this way? <laughs> True story. We've known each other for a long time. I've given you good business. $15? $15? I will make you good business, and we will transform Mehran into just a, in, not just a community hall, but into a dinner theater experience. And Fayaz thought about it, and he brought the cost down to $6 for a five-course buffet meal, endless supply of chai, and cured dessert with the hall. OK, I went to another relative an uncle, and said, if I gave you a dinner theater experience, stage reading, and a buffet for $15, would you come? True story. Uncle looks at me and says, if you make it $10, I'll think about it. <laughs> so we made it 10 bucks. We made it 10 bucks, and they said if 50 people showed up, it'd be a success. We publicized using this antiquated technology from the 20th century called Evite. You might remember it. it still exists. Use listservs reached out to local South Asian communities, organizations, members, word of mouth spread. Guess how many people showed up? Interactive crowd, love it. 450. 450 people showed up. The capacity was 220. We fit 350, don't ask me how. And most people who showed up, to be honest, they showed up out of curiosity. They're, and I said, I want to speak Urdu, but I know it's going to be on YouTube. But a lot of Pakistani uncles were like, eh, this is, what is this, this play? We'll come out and see. Let's see. And one Pakistani uncle came up to me and said, true story. He said, beta, son, why don't you do something useful with your life? <laughs> like protest. Look what's happening <laughs> in 2003. All that's happening. Go protest. What is this play writing, share writing? True story. I'll get back to that uncle in a second. So. We had no money, and we rehearsed for this play in the backyard of Ishmael Reed, my producer, and Carla Blank, his wife, the director. And just a quick note on Ishmael Reed. I was so, uh, such a bumpkin that in college, I didn't know that Ishmael Reed is a MacArthur Genius winner, twice nominated Pulitzer writer. And in his backyard, me and six other Pakistanis are rehearsing, where my mom made the dal and biryani on the weekends, and I, of course, supplied the chai. We did the play. Play was a huge success. We're like, awesome, great, wonderful. I think I'm done with my life. I decided to go to law school to become honorable. And during the first year of law school, during the summer where we're supposed 
to actually do something useful, like you know, apply to a corporation, an opportunity presented itself to perform the play at the Berkeley Repertory Theater, which is a major regional theater. We decided we'll do it. I was completely broke, had no money, got a little bit of money from my friends. Again, we performed, we, we did the rehearsals in the backyard of Ishmael and Carla Blank. We needed to dress the set to make it look like a Pakistani American home. So naturally, we used furniture from my home. My grandmother comes home one day, comes downstairs and says, Beta, are we moving? And, and, my, and my grandmother is a 75-year-old heart patient at that time. We had to sit her down and say, no, no, it'll come back in three days. We promise. Now, the play was always intended for a global multicultural audience. People, again, made fun of us, said no one would show up. We had no money, so we had to stretch the dollar into 20, use new media, needed to create a press release, so went to Sheikh Google, typed in press release, how to make press release. Figured it out, wrote a press release, sent it out, got local press, got the front page of SF Chronicle, which then intrigued a BBC journalist to come by to the 2005 Berkeley Repertory Theatre performance, which was a week after the 7-7 London subway bombing, of course perpetrated by Pakistani Muslims. And everyone at that time, 2005, finally Pakistan came in the news, unfortunately for wrong reasons, and everyone was curious about the city in India named Pakistan. And you're like, no, dude, Pakistan's a country, just don't worry about it. Pakistan's a different country. But everyone was curious. Play sold out, got standing ovations, multicultural audience. A Couple months later, we did it at San Jose for 9-11-2005, play sold out again. BBC, that same journalist, sent back word to BBC headquarters. They did a 10 minute piece on us, all right? In 9-11-2005, the BBC folks liked the play so much that they said, can we, on our BBC letterhead, solicit every theater in London to perform this play because it's so important and we need it? I thought about it and said, yes. <laughs> yes, you can. Uh, but at that time, 2005, was it 2005, for those who remember, if we can go into our 1985 uh, DeLorean and do time travel back to 2005, it was a crazy time where Dixie Chicks were considered traitors. You guys remember this? Dixie chicks are the whitest women on earth. They're blonde, they sing country music, they love the God, and they're married. Could you imagine what they would have done with a guy like me? 2005? So a lot of Pakistanis and Muslims, and the play's not controversial, were like, do you really want this message out there right now? And the feedback we got from a lot of the theaters was they liked the play, but they wanted me to change it. So I said, how do you want me to change it? Oh, they're like, you know, just some of the things just change it. I'm like, can you tell me what you want me to change? And they're like, just, you know, eh, yeah. And so we realized that was code word for take away some of the politics, take away some of the religion. So we decided we had to wait. Fast forward, now I would think that I have these two successful premieres, life would be awesome, I'd become a wealthy playwright, I'd travel the world and I'd sleep on the bed of a money with dozens of women and my life would be made. Wrong. Fast forward to 2007, I graduate from law school, and I end up back in my family home, in my high school bedroom, completely broke, with my father putting $5 bills in my wallet every day. Out of desperation and frustration, I decide to write an article, and this article was a truncated article uh, from a report, uh, from a, actually a paper I'd written in law school about Blackwater and private military firms in Iraq. I submitted it to an online magazine, it got published. They said, if you want to submit any time, submit it. I said, really? They said, really? I was hooked. I started submitting op-eds. I wanted to interview this dude named Seymour Hirsch, who's this Pulitzer-winning journalist, just for the hell of it, because you're jobless sitting at home going crazy, and you get ideas like, I want to interview Seymour Hirsch. So I went to Sheikh Google, Googled Seymour Hirsch phone number, and I found one. I swear, <laughs> sorry, Seymour Hirsch. Uh, and I cold call Seymour Hirsch, Guy picks up the phone. I'm like, I, I'm a freelance journalist, Seymour Hirsch. I would like to interview you. He says, call me back two weeks later. We'll schedule the interview. I call him back two weeks later. He was in a bad mood. I'm like, I'm that Muslim American journalist who wants to interview you. He goes, huh? I already did the Muslims. I did Al Jazeera. And I'm like, no, no, this is something else. So he said, well, if you want to, after 20 minutes, being son of Pakistani immigrants, I kept him on the phone, convinced him to talk to me. He said, well, if you want to, if we do this hypothetical interview, throw me a hypothetical question. I threw him a hypothetical question, he answered it. I said, if we did a hypothetical interview, that's how it'd go. He goes, hypothetical interview? This is the effing interview. 
get out your uh, recorder, let's go, let's go. I didn't have a recorder, so I sat there with my phone on my shoulder and typed transcript of the entire interview. That was my first interview, it got published, led to another online magazine saying, if you want to publish any time, go ahead. I said, sure. Within six months, I published 50 articles, maybe 75 within a period of a year, and all of a sudden, people were calling me a journalist. I said, okay. People were inviting me to journalism conferences to give talks to journalists, which I thought was kind of hilarious, but I went because it was free and they gave me free food. Now, fast forward, spring of 2007, I get a job in a kind of shady immigration law firm run by South Asians, and I get a lot of free time. So I'm working as an attorney finally, and there's this guy named Barack Hussein Obama who could have become president, and I thought to myself, the tides are changing, maybe is now the time for this play Domestic Crusaders. So, also, I was, about, I was about to turn 28, and anyone who's younger than the age of 30, you'd realize that some of us go through a premature midlife crisis, and I thought I would die by the age of 30. I literally thought I would die. I thought I would wake up at the age of 30, have a cardiac like, heart, heart attack, die, the, like the earth would open up, swallow my body, and it'd be over. So I'm like, I need to do something before I die at the age of 30. The only thing I've done which is worthwhile is this play, Domestic Crusaders. I have to get this play staged in New York. For whatever reason, I said, we have to do it on 9-11. And then I said, I have to get it published. This is what I must do before I die at the age of 30. Now, what happened is I found someone called the New Yorican Poets Cafe in New York that said, if you raise $24,000 within one year, we'll give you five weeks in our theater. We'll give you from 9-11, Oh eight, excuse me, 9-11-09 to October. They said, you have to raise $24,000 and we'll give you the space. So, what I did was, I created an elevator pitch in the form of a half a page email. I used Sheikh Google, I used the internets, I used your competition, Macebook. I used uh, the Twitter, Are you, is Twitter your competition? Not yet, right? Not yet, not yet. I used Twitter. <laughs> I used the blogosphere, I used any network I could and sent this elevator pitch in the form of an email out, like a message in a bottle, to do fundraising. I also opened up a PayPal account. The first fundraiser was done by my Vietnamese American friends from high school who raised me $1,500. A lady by the name of Zeba Iqbal, all the way in New York, read my story, said, I believe in what you're trying to do. Let me invite you to New York, maybe we can raise some money. Went to New York for the first time in my life, raised the, the second $1,500. Word of mouth started to spread, and little by little, $5 here, $10 here, $15 there, I ended up raising $31,000. The last money came two weeks before the play's premiere uh, due to an anonymous check. Thank you. But what really happened was I realized we needed messengers because no one wanted to hear the story of a Pakistani chaiwala doing a play with six Pakistani characters who aren't doing bhangra or blowing themselves up. And I realized, in the world we live in, we need to get validated by the people. Now, who are the people? I'll finish up in two minutes. Who are the people? Good question. After every Domestic Crusader performance, someone from my ethnic community, ethnic, used to come up to me and say the following. Psst, Majad, come here. I'm like, what? He goes, come here. I'm like, what's up? Play was great. But what do the people think about it? I'm like, well, you saw the play in front of people. There were people to your left, people to your right. The people seemed to like it. They gave a standing ovation. They're like, not those people, the people. And, I, and here is, here's some community interaction. The people is a code word for who? Intelligence. Not intelligence. Nice job of being politically correct. White. <laughs> white people. Yes, the white people. I said, don't worry about the white people. The white people are OK. You don't have to hold the white people's hands. I have faith in the white people. I love the white people. Some of my best friends are the people. Don't worry about it, it'll be okay. But we realized we need messengers and validators, so I made a list of 250 people I respected. <laughs> I really respected. Writers, poets, playwrights, activists, and I didn't have any of their email or contacts, so for a year, until 3 a.m. at night, using Sheikh Google, I'm not making this up, and search engines, I found any email contact I could a publicist, a manager, an agent, anything. Created an Excel sheet, sent out my half-page elevator uh, pitch, half-page elevator pitch. I got the contact of Emma Thompson, all right, Academy Award-winning actress. Through her publicist, she sends me an email back finally saying, your play sounds great, I want to read it. Send me a hard copy. I send a hard copy. 
I think, you know what, I'm never going to hear back from her. A couple of months later, uh, a friend of mine, Gunnar Strads, who gets all the Domestic Crusader mails, says, hey, there is a, a letter from some lady named Emma, Emma Tumps. Emma Tumps. You know anyone named Emma Tumps? I'm like, I don't know any name Emma Tumps. Oh, wait, Emma Thompson. I, Emma Thompson? Freaking read the paper right now, Ned. What's going on? <laughs> don't waste time. He mails me the letter. Emma Thompson writes me a two-page handwritten letter saying how much she loves the play, how she wants to support it, and she gives me her personal email address. Says, contact me if you want help. Being the son of Pakistani immigrants, I said, sure, I need some help. Can you give me a review blurb? She gives me a great review blurb where she attaches her name to the play and says, help me and Wajahat staging this play. Then she says, ask me if you want anything else. So I said, well, if you are asking, why don't, we, uh, why don't you give me some funds if you want to do it, if you want to you know, just donate. So she sends me a check for like about $1,500. We get people like Jan Martel, the author of Life of Pi. We get people like Dave Eggers. We end up getting all these validators, diverse validators, not just the people, but also the ethnics, right? We go to, we go to Sheikh Google, press press release. Using all our contacts, we send out the press release to every mainstream outlet. It's about August 2009. The play is premiering 9-11, 2009 in New York. Two and a half weeks before the play, we don't have a single uh, article on us, not a single interview. I had faith. I said, wait for it. Within the last week, if you build it, they will come. And within the last week of the play's premiere, we got the New York Times feature, we got MSNBC, we got NBC, we got Al Jazeera, we got local, national, international press. People thought we would fail. 9-11 opening night, diverse multicultural crowd sold out. Word of mouth spread. We ended up selling out week three, week four, and week five by the beginning of the third week. The New York and Poets Cafe, who was terrified that we will sell no tickets, told us at the end of our run that we broke their 40-year box office records. And then, yeah, thanks. And then after, <laughs> I'll take one wow. Fine. Because uh, this is Google, right? People are like, Psh, five weeks. Why wasn't it 50 weeks? Loser. Do you have Google stock like I do? <laughs> no, I'm better than you. I know how Pakistanis think. It's all good. It's all good. But I sold out. And we broke the box office records. And to finish, to finish, I came back and I had this dream, this vow, I was 28, to publish this play by the time I turned 30. Long story short, through this journalism career, blogging career, lawyer career that just kind of fortuitously bubbled up in the last two years, I had a connection with a Pulitzer-nominated author and publisher of McSweeney's, uh, Dave Eggers. And the email literally went like this. Half-page email. Hey, dude, I have a good idea. McSweeney should publish Domestic Crusaders. Here's 10 reasons why. If anyone has received emails from me, they realize it seems like it's sent by a six-year-old child. I don't use capitalization, grammar, or anything. It's like pidgin English. And I'd even use one, two, three. I just did dashes. I'm like, uh, you guys haven't written a play. Uh, the play's important. Uh, it'll help you with the multicultural audiences. Uh, you like the play. And so why not? He re responds back to me in typical professional fashion. Dude, that's a great idea. Let me give it to my board. It's not up to me. The board reads the play, unanimous, unanimously decides to publish the play. And then a day after turning 30, I held the first copy of The Domestic Crusaders that got published in January 2001 is now being taught at universities. Thank you. And I can now announce that I just signed the contract right before coming to Google at Postal Annex. I sent it off. And Domestic Crusaders, after 10 years, is actually going to be in London in 2013. And Emma Thompson, who's been so nice, sent me an email last night, said, invite. I look forward to it. I'm going to come see your production. Come eat uh, dinner at my house. I will cook for you. I really want to meet you and your wife. She really loved my marriage story, which is on my blog. Shameless, shameless promotion. But that's Emma Thompson and people like Dave Eggers, the people like Carla Blank, my director, people like Ishmael Reed, a community who believed in me that 10 years now down the line, after I had left the play, because I published it and I'm like, I'm done. And the play got a life of its own. And then after I had published it and left, people have been coming to me for the past two years, universities, colleges, student groups, and now England. And it's been a long, fulfilling journey. And I want to end it on this note, that uncle in 2003, remember at Mehran restaurant who said, Beta, do something useful. Go protest. That uncle came up to me about three years ago when we were doing the play in New York. That same uncle came up to me and said, listen, I've been in this country for 40 years. I've done everything right. 
I'm a successful engineer, I've paid taxes, I've raised my kids right, I've never done anything wrong. I turn on the TV and they still see me as either a cab driver or a terrorist. I wish I would have made one of my sons into a storyteller like you. I realize there's so much value in storytelling. Keep doing what you're doing, I support you. And so that's something fulfilling after 10 years. And now I get to travel like the world and I don't ride my law degree, I ride my pen. And once in a while, when I'm lucky, someone makes chai for me for a change. So thank you for having me, Bugul. I'm done. You guys have five minutes. You hear that, YouTube? You hear that? All right. That was very engaging. I was just wandering through the halls and uh, heard you talking. And you were engaging enough to keep me occupied for your entire story. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. Uh, the check is in the mail. <laughs> you performed admirably. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, I actually wanted to know about your upcoming stuff. I know you're working on a sure. screenplay and uh, another play, so if you can tell us about sure, that. Sure. The upcoming stuff. Um, I'm working on my first movie screenplay with a really cool director by the name of Josh Seftel. He made this movie called War Incorporated. I wish I could tell you more. It's a really cool story. It's a fictional take on a real life character who does some amazing work. Um, so I'm learning how to do a screenplay. That's fun. Me and Dave Eggers for two years have been working on a TV pilot. HBO commissioned us on a pitch we made about an American Muslim cop in the Bay Area. I really like the damn pilot. I'm not just saying that because we wrote it, but I really think it's damn good. Uh, and it's a very, very Bay Area pilot. It's not just San Francisco, it's East Bay and San Francisco. It's very real, very nuanced and layered. We did the third draft. I kicked over the third draft to Dave. He has to do the final edits. Let's see what happens. And somehow, this weird, circuitous pa professional path has led to me being a researcher on Islamophobia in America. And uh, I've been working on some upcoming research about the rise of Islamophobia, but specifically uh, labeling and singling out the Islamophobes. And we labeled them in, our, in a big report we did last year called uh, Fear Incorporated, the Roots of the Islamophobia Network in America, where we, for the first time ever, it was a six-month investigative report where we traced all the funding trace the major Islamophobic players and how they have created these memes that have entered in the mainstream, such as President Obama is a Muslim, he isn't, or anti-Sharia threat, and so forth. So it's, it's this really weird path. But my family would really, really like me to still be an attorney, and they're still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. But not my parents. My parents, non-typical, non-stereotypical South Asian parents, I, always, I want to give a shout out to my parents, have always supported me since I was literally like nine or 10 years old. So they keep telling me to do what I'm doing. But the, the larger family, Pakistanis are a breeding people. We, we, we travel in a horde of 60 or 70. So they, they to this day still think I failed in my life and have not utilized my law career. And they think literally I just sit there doing emails all night till uh, 4 a.m. But that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, Hello. Talk. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know what you think of the state of Muslim arts is in the US and what we could do to kind of encourage it. Ah, oh, crap, a thesis question. The state of Muslim arts right now. Actually, it's a very good question. Um, real quick, I think, uh, you know, it's not surprising that after 9-11, we saw a figurative, creative explosion of American Muslim artistic endeavors. And if, any time you look at any ethnic minority, it usually takes tremendous pain or love that inspires this, right? A African Americans, Irish Catholic, Jewish Americans, Jewish Americans, African Americans, not surprising, suffer tremendously. Also, some of the creators of the best art in America, right? And I think there's a permanent fork road in the timeline of 9-11. We want to escape, but hopefully we reach the post-post-9-11 climate. And what we saw in the past 10 years is you see American Muslims, like lawyers, doctors, and engineers, who left the Trinity to do stand-up comedy. Now we see people like Willow Wilson, my friend, who's a graphic novelist and writing a book called Aleph. You see people emerging in spoken word. And what, what we're witnessing now, and this is a test for the American Muslims, is when it comes to any ethnic, minor, ethnic minority that doesn't have mainstream publicity, they want every single representation to be an avatar of perfection, right? So they're like, this is our one shot at having a play. This is our one shot at having a Muslim. We have to tell every single story that exists under the sun. We have to show them how we're perfect. And every time you expose warts, 
there's tremendous pushback from the community, which is what me and others have witnessed, right? Because they want the avatar of perfection. But what we know is that good art reflects the warts. It makes it interesting. No one wants to see a perfect story. It's boring. And you want art to resonate. So what we're seeing now is a shift where I think many American and Muslim artists, I know many of them, they've had such tremendous strain on them to always make their art quote unquote Islamic, right? There's always a tendency among Muslim circles that the art has to be Islamic. What does that mean? And there's like this religious police that says, you didn't say Bismillah and Aslamu Alaikum and didn't have four surahs in there. It's, this is not Islamic. And they completely dismiss it. And what I want is to see more artists who just happen to be Muslim. And that must mean also the way our art gets better is to change the mentality of American Muslim communities where you have to make a big tent approach to American Islam. That means that if a person identifies as Muslim, I'm not interested in their piety or their religiosity. If they identify as a Muslim and they're willing to contribute to the dialogue and give something back, we have to give them that space. We have to acknowledge that space. And likewise, we have to acknowledge artists in that space. It might not always be religious or pious or conservative or liberal or progressive because the progressives go against the, you know, the conservatives, all these labels. My concern is number one, make the art good because I think good art attracts good audiences. Make it authentic. And I think we as a community then through our art can really push the boundaries and make the tent of American Islam bigger to encompass all the stories, not just one story. And I hope I answered that question. But we're seeing it now. Finally, 10 years later, we're finally seeing the shift where you see an artist say, I'm writing a play, not about Muslims or Islam, just a play about people, and I happen to be an American Muslim. And that's okay. And if an American Muslim says, you know what, I want to write a play which has a political edge and a religious edge, they should have that space too. I hope I, I, hope I got you there. Obviously, the, uh, um, you mentioned earlier the, your ties to the, uh, or, you know, the purported ties that people make of you to these like, extremist groups and all of this. Right. Um, I'm curious if that started as a result of Domestic Crusaders or as a result of the Fear, Inc. publication. Right. So I, I joked, I was joking about my fictional ties to extremist groups, ex quote unquote extremist groups. Look, uh, it started as a result of my, the publication of Fear Incorporated where we literally named all the names of the key Islamophobes. And we went, in, went into it very strategically knowing that's how they'll retaliate. Because one of their key goals is to marginalize any American Muslim voice that becomes prominent, either in Google or politics or the media, that threatens their narrative, which paints a civilizational war between the West versus Islam. So anytime an American Muslim voice emerges in the mainstream, they want to marginalize that voice. It's been happening for the past 10 years. Strategically, I, we knew that was going to happen. I looked at my track record, and, I, and I'm like, okay, let them come after me. And after the publication of Fear, Inc., which has been a year, they have tried in a very desperate, amusing fashion to call me like, Bajad Ali, a man of hate. And every time they print out something, I just sit there and read it and laugh with my friends, which I don't know if it's normal, because my friends, my friends get really upset on my behalf. They're like, well, Jihad Ali, look what they did. You know, my, all my friends, regardless of ethnicity, they're like, I can't believe they did that. I just think it's very funny. So I just read it and I laugh. And they make these bizarre, obtuse links, right? So they said, I was a member of a social group, Muslim Student Association. And they make these crazy links. And then they say, look, I am a pawn of the radical Muslim Brotherhood with the agenda to infiltrate America and replace the Constitution with Sharia, right? So this has been happening. But because we've seen a shift in the past one year, two year, where the Islamophobes have become so extreme, and unfortunately, they've infiltrated the Republican Party. The Republicans now even are like, this is bad news for our brand name and our party, which is why you see people like John McCain and even Boehner go against Michelle Bachman, who I guys, if you don't know, last year Michelle Bachman came out with a memo saying these names of these American Muslims, she named the names, are, are, are part of the radical Muslim Brotherhood agenda. As a result of this witch hunt and fear mongering, she was blasted by John McCain, Boehner, and even her former campaign manager, Ed Rollins, who said it was shameful. But she raised a million dollars in a month based on that fear mongering, right? So they try to come after me, but it's been very minor. Uh, mostly because I've deliberately spoken to a multicultural audience, deliberately, intentionally, and I, I've been, you know, I've never said anything really radical. I mean, if you look at my stuff, I stand by my, my political opinions even those that might be unpopular, I've tried to be very fair. Uh, they've tried to attack me, but it hasn't stuck. And that's why I'm like, okay, if you want to come after me, come after me. I'll come after you. 
which is what we're doing. And my, my hope is to expose the Islamophobes. I want to be very transparent because they're a poison to America and specifically in light of Anders Breivik, the Norwegian, mass, you know, the Norwegian murderer who killed 77 people. He left behind a 1500 page manifesto where he cites all these American Islamophobes that are mentioned in the Fear Inc. report. And experts have said that they didn't cause him to do this, but he emerges from the same ideological infrastructure. So we want to expose them because we see them as a poison. And when you expose people like this, yes, you get hit, but I've been very lucky that nothing's been able to stick. So that's why I joke about it so openly. I'm like, yeah, Barack Obama, my Muslim president, we hang out and have dal and drink chai. <laughs> Sometimes we eat pork. I'm just kidding. I don't eat pork. He's not Muslim. If he is Muslim, he's the worst Muslim of all time. <laughs> Chillax. All right. I hope I answered your question. I went a little too detailed into it. Yeah, good? Great. Probably a two-part question. Uh, one is just building on what you just talked about, what's happening with the recent movie and which is uh, going on YouTube. Right. And so the entire process, I also want you to talk about the mentality of the people and your, your psychoanalysis of the situation. A psychoanalysis <laughs> of the situation, wow. Okay. I should have okay. gotten paid by Google. Google needs to pay me next time. <laughs> sure, go ahead. You are a playwright, so you, I believe you would have that view. Yeah. And the second is, if you're, do, you, do you think about doing these plays yourself, going out in Muslim countries to actually build awareness within those countries about what, what they are fighting for, or what America is for, or what the values are. You cheated with a two-part question, <laughs> but I'm going to answer. Very quickly, I think when it comes to this uh, unfortunate uh, movie that was released on YouTube and subsequently has spurned uh, protests across Muslim communities that has re resulted in deaths, um, I think extremism begets extremism. And I say that because the makers of this documentary uh, if you look at their ideological ties, one of the film's promoters uh, deliberately said, specifically said, we hoped this would happen, which he's talking about the riots. And he has ideological ties to people like Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer, who are some of the key Islamophobes we mentioned in Fear Incorporated, who are members of the hate group Stop Islamization of, of America. So do they have a right to create inflammatory material like this? I strongly believe they do. Uh, does that give a right to anyone to respond with violence? No. As a Muslim, I think those Muslims who try to rationalize and validate their violent response by say they are defending the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad are in fact betraying the legacy, spirit, and etiquette of the Prophet Muhammad. And I'm not just saying that uh, just you know, to mince words to be nice. I mean, I sincerely mean that. I had tremendous anger when I saw people respond violently. At the same time, what we should know is that there's 1.5 billion Muslims. And even in countries like Libya, in Egypt, what we saw, and I'm glad due to globalization we can finally get this in the mainstream, you saw protests against the violent protesters. You saw like 30,000 Libyans come out peacefully protesting the violent protests that killed the ambassador Chris Stevens. And even you saw images of Muslims worldwide saying this does not represent Islam. So when people say, why does the Muslim world behave like this? You say, it's not the Muslim world. Islam doesn't speak, Muslims do, and there's 1.4 billion Muslims. It's just a minority faction in Pakistan, Egypt, and so forth. But a problem exists within these countries, and it's, it's very deliberate when you see the countries, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya. I mean, you see they went through the Arab Spring last year. It's not surprising at all to me that certain factions are trying to play up on this, which they do. And uh, I think what we're seeing now, though, is a shift where people understand that it's not the majority of Muslims in America. Uh, the narrative still persists. It's troubling. Um, and I think, again, extremism begets extremism. And this is why stories are so important, because you need more narratives out there, right? You need more narratives than the Rage Boy cover that came out on Newsweek last week. You guys see that cover? Out of all the messengers, they chose I and Hirsi Ali. Newsweek has every right. But it's like, I always joked, I said, like, asking Ayan Hirsi Ali to talk about Muslims is asking like Mel Gibson to do a convening about Jews, right? Just because Jews will be like, out of all the people that you could choose, why would you choose someone who has made a career out of being inflammatory and scholastically incorrect with their analysis, right? And so again, you see sensationalism dominate the news. Um, but I think it does bring up good points about art, the role of art, the power of art, cartoons, you know, people say art exists in a vacuum, it doesn't. 
it informs the vacuum, it reflects, it informs the vacuum, it reflects society, and sometimes, unfortunately, it explodes that vacuum. Um, and I think there's a responsibility for Muslims also to step up, clergy, artists, writers, and, and, and they have to denounce that act. And I think there is a strategy that needs to be to respond intelligently, okay? Which is something that sometimes we don't do. Pakistani uncles take a chai and yell at Bill O'Reilly at their home. It's fun to yell at Bill O'Reilly and Fox News, but maybe there's some more important strategies. For the second question, very quick, interest has come from many Muslim countries, Muslim countries. Pakistan is really interested and they see value in it. I think uh, if we pull it off in England, I signed the contract, let's see what happens. I think we go transatlantic first and I think it will trickle down to other countries. But the beautiful thing about being published uh, is you know, people are reading it all around the world. And I know Lums University, anyone who went to Lums here in Lahore, one person, congratulations. Uh, Lums University has taught the play. So it's good. I hope I was able to answer your two-part thesis question. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Shohar. Thank you, Google.